So if you were to ask somebody to think about a chemical reaction, or you yourself were to think about a chemical reaction, you'd probably come up with uh, an explosion, or maybe even the production of fire. Didn't know I could do that. A anyway, we understand that in some chemical reactions there's an output of energy, either in the form of heat or light. And if we think about it, we could also understand that there are some processes that require an input of energy. I mean, think about uh, ice melting, for example. It requires that energy be input in order to change from one state to another. So within chemical changes and even physical changes, we understand that there's energy involved. Now the study of this energy, at least as it relates to chemical reactions or chemical processes, is what we call thermochemistry. But just where does this energy come from? So what I have here are two magnets. Now, if we think about a chemical bond, as a chemical bond is being broken, much like these magnets, it takes energy to overcome the attractive forces. And when new bonds form, we can hear that energy is released as a result of these two forces coming together, or these two substances coming together in forming that bond. So if we think about this as an analogy to a chemical bond, it takes energy to break chemical bonds, and energy is released when bonds form. Now there's going to be a discrepancy or a difference in these two values, and whatever that is, is ultimately going to result in a net release of energy to the surroundings, or a net requirement of energy from the surroundings. And if there's a net release of energy to the surroundings, especially if it's a large amount, we're going to get heat and light being produced. And this type of reaction is something that we call an exothermic reaction. Think about things exiting or leaving. So in this case, we're talking about energy or heat being lost to the surroundings. And we sometimes see that in the form of heat or light. But in the reverse process of that, let's say that there's a net energy being absorbed to that particular chemical system or that process. In that case, we have an overall energy input from the surroundings into that chemical reaction or that process, and we say that that is endothermic. So we have two types of reactions that we can talk about when we look at thermochemistry. Again, we have exothermic reactions where there's a net release of energy to the surroundings, and we have endothermic processes where there is a net absorption or taking in of energy from its surroundings. So just as we use balanced chemical equations to represent how and what reactants form what products and in what ratios, we're now going to include energy or heat into these balanced chemical equations as something called thermochemical equations. And there's a few ways that we can represent this. The first is to include our energy within the chemical equation itself. So for an endothermic process where energy is put in, we see this energy included on the reactant side. For an exothermic reaction in which energy is going to be released or produced as a result of this chemical reaction, we're going to see it on the product side. There's also another way when we start to quantify this, we can remove it and treat it as something that we call enthalpy. Now, enthalpy is a little bit challenging to explain, but ultimately for our purposes in introductory chemistry, it's effectively the heat or energy that's required, or the heat or the energy that's released as a result of a chemical process. So there is no zero value, but what we can measure is the change in the overall enthalpy by figuring out how much heat is lost or gained. So when we go to include this in a thermochemical equation, those that are exothermic see a net loss of enthalpy because they are losing energy or heat to the surroundings. And as a result, we see this delta H as a negative sign. Whereas for an endothermic reaction, energy or heat is put into the system, and as a result it's gained, and so we see that it has a positive value when we put its delta H into that equation. Now there is another way that we can represent what goes on in a thermochemical process, and that's using something called an enthalpy diagram. And in this enthalpy diagram, as I indicated, there's no zero value, it's just a relative measure of enthalpy of reactants and products. And if we take a look at an endothermic process, we can see that since energy is input into this particular system, that the reactants are going to have lower enthalpy than the products are. And ultimately, we can put in an increase in the overall enthalpy of this particular reaction. Whereas for exothermic reactions, we can see that since energy is going to be lost or given off to the surroundings, ultimately what we have are reactants that have a higher overall enthalpy than the products, and we can see that over the course of this reaction, we can equate it to having a loss of enthalpy 
as this reaction proceeds. Now, these seem a little vague in terms of the amount of energy that's going to be released or absorbed. I mean, wouldn't it be beneficial in a chemical reaction to know just how much energy is going to be produced, or just how much energy might be required? Well, yeah, I mean, those are kind of rhetorical questions, aren't they? There's got to be some way that we can establish values or quantify the amount of energy that's lost or gained in a chemical process so that we can include those in our thermochemical equations and enthalpy diagrams. So stay tuned for how we figure that out. Thanks for watching.